So firstly, I want to quickly thank the museum, uh, Stephen Welsh, uh, Esme Ward, um, Irit uh, Narkis and all the other helpers, the technical team, uh, did for their encouragement and the help in bringing these pieces. And secondly, Kaiser and, and the MacFest team, again for the encouragement and getting this thing together. Um, I don't do these things regularly, I've done one or two in the United States, uh, I haven't done presentations for a long time. So we put this together, and my, my daughter Sahar and Mia as well helped me um, for the last week or so of putting it together. I'm a wife as well, Nazi, I might as well mention it. <laughs> so, uh, if anybody's gonna, I know some of you might want blankets and pillows, I know you're gonna get possibly bored. Uh, I think they put this guy up here, T Rex, and this one to bat my head off if it gets really boring. So I'm not sure, I'm a bit concerned about this thing above me. What I'm hoping is not gonna go that way. Um, let me see if this thing's working first. So, I'm in my head, getting my head around this. Okay, so the collection has, um, it, 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 as I said, the collection lives in the United States and in the United Kingdom. And if you're calling it the Abe and Khalid collection or the Salem and Khalid collection, uh, you, you'll have to talk to me to explain why it's across two continents. Uh, there's about 1,500, maybe 2,000 pieces because it's still accumulated. Probably out of those, there's about 200, maybe 250 pieces which are deemed important. Because in this period, 18th and 19th century, there was a plethora and prolific in you know, the manufacture of these pieces. So when we first started getting serious about it, we didn't really know what we were buying or collecting. And then when we started sifting and sorting through it, we started getting like our head down there. And we were realizing that, wait a minute, some of these pieces are actually quite important. As the screen says, some of the pieces were let go a few years ago in Christie's and Sotheby's where we didn't really know what we were doing and money was really important. Um, and then when we realized the importance, look at it, the bulk of the collection is still together. So, um, and it's, as I said, it's, it's about 50 years in, in accumulating, but probably last 20 years or so it's really moved on to the collection. So, the collection has uh, appeared in the United States in, in, in a big conference there. Uh, this is at the Victoria and Albert. These were the heads of the uh, uh, museums from all over the world uh, discussing the 19th century and as you can see it's been referenced there by Marcus Millwright who I'll mention uh, uh, you know, in the research. So the research is being led um, by uh, Professor Marcus Millwright from the University of uh, British Columbia, Victoria in, in uh, Canada. Uh, then there's Professor Peter Northover, some of you might know him. Um, he is the, the head of Oxford University Metal Department, so he was, I think he may have retired now. He's dealing with the metal analysis. Uh, Dr. Abdullah Campbell from Cali University, he's dealing with Arabic poetry. If any of you can read Arabic poetry, it's an extremely difficult field. Just because you can read Arabic doesn't mean you can understand Arabic poetry. Uh, Dr. Eamon Salem in Los Angeles, he's an expert in epigraphy 
and uh, calligraphy uh, and imagery. So he's been in the field, that kind of side of things. Um, we've, we, over the last 10 years, we've put a, a portfolio together of uh, photographs. Umma down there, he's, he's an architect, he's helped with the photography and Munir. Um, this, the, the reason the photographs were done is so that all the sides of these pieces can be read by uh, researchers all over the world. Because there's a database that's going to be, is being created, and that database is going to be accessible by the Louvre, by any research establishment across the world. A student can be sat in, say, Mongolia, they can access it, they can read the pieces for their thesis or whatever, and it's going to become live probably in the next few months. Uh, the research papers have also been done by Marcus Millwright and a couple of other researchers, and it's leading to a book, but, you know, books in this field can take 10 years or maybe longer. Uh, so we'll move on to the next slide. So this is uh, me lecturing the lecturers at the VNA uh, with some of the pieces. Again, I took some of those down, some of the important pieces, because, you know, it, the museums never collected much of this stuff in the 18th and 19th century because it wasn't deemed important enough. And that's an important point because that's what's got us here. Because luckily we'd collected them thinking they're decorative and then later on realized that actually some of the pieces were standing out more so than others, more so than the usual tourist stuff that came from Egypt and uh, Syria in the 18th and the 19th century. So that's why museums themselves, they've only got like ones or twos of pieces. So they're, they're quite amazed that somebody's gone and got it together. Um, so as I said at the start of this uh, talk, and I'm timing myself, to understand this, we have to go back up to a thousand years. Um, Islamic metalwork encompasses metalwork of the, you know, the countries which have had Islamic rule since 622. It's called Islamic metalwork, but the patrons were not always Muslim. The manufacturers, the makers were not always Muslim. A lot of the lands were Muslim at one time, and then they were not Muslim. You know, the, the wars were going on, different rulers came, Spain, uh, you know, towards uh, India. So it wasn't... When we say Islamic metalwork, it's, it's metalwork of lands which was covered by Islamic rule at one point or another, Dar es Salaam or the land of, land of Islam. The, the early metalwork, um, it, it, it was normally kind of like plain bronzes and copper and brass. There wasn't anything kind of really too detailed. There was calligraphy, but you could see that the, there was, as I said, there was already skill in those countries. And... Um, the, you know, the Muslim metalsmiths, they, they, were, they were recognized anyway. For example, the Crusades, the, you know, Damascus swords were legendary. You know, this sword was regarded as a sword that could chop, uh, hew a stone in half. And with the same sword, if you threw a handkerchief, a lady's handkerchief, silken handkerchief in the air and landed on the sword, it would cut in half, which is obviously is a bit of a, a myth. But this is how highly regarded Damascus swords were. Uh, then there was the gold-like high zinc brass. I mean, I know it's a bit technical, but if you put more zinc into brass, uh, copper, with copper, you get a, a much yellower colored brass. It became so yellow that some unscrupulous uh, you know, merchants in Muslim lands were using this coinage as gold. And they were tricking and confusing the um, uh, Vikings uh, and, and so one of the sultans actually said, right, this is enough. From now on, we're going to have to brand the real gold because, you know, this, this high zinc uh, brass is fooling these Vikings. And, and no wonder those Vikings, when they probably got back home, they thought, right, let's smash that country, England, over. You know what I mean? They were probably so peed off. Uh, so anyway, so we'll move on from there. Uh, this is a quick map of the, I don't know whether you guys can see at the back, but this is the, from 800 to 1200, the Dar es Salaam, the land of Islam or whatever. All sorts of dynasties and all sorts of rulerships are on there. But you need to kind of digest that to kind of understand where the metalwork started, or the, especially the inlaid stuff. So moving on, this is again an early piece, 689. Don't worry, these are not in my collection, so you don't need to report me to the police. These are in, in all in museums, in the Hermitage or Metropolitan or the British Museum. So this uh, bronze ewer from Iraq in Basra. Uh, there's another piece here, which is an amazing piece in, uh, from Iraq again in 796 AD. And this one's got calligraphy and detailing, if you can't see it at the back. And this again is a ewer, uh, but it's a zoomorphic form. Um, and then this next one is, by, that, by this time, the 11th century, the Muslim artisans had become superb at metalwork. This is, I don't know whether many of you know this, this is the P world famous Pisa Griffin. 
And it sat for centuries on top of the Duomo in Pisa, which is the cathedral. And in 11, I think 1828, when they brought it down for cleaning, they saw on it, it had this calligraphy. And they were bamboozled. They didn't, everybody had forgotten how this thing had got there. And this is the biggest existing uh, bronze from the Islamic world in, 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 you know, around at this time, uh, totally priceless. The original now is actually in the cathedral. So if you ever go to Pisa, you have to go inside the cathedral on top of the actual uh, cathedral now. Uh, you can see it just there. That's a replica. But that's how good they got by the 11th century. And then a change uh, started happening. This is the first golden age of the Islamic metalwork. The, about 1100 to 1300, I don't know whether any of you guys know your history, the Gurids, they were doing raids into India, they were raiding uh, uh, kind of half of China, they were raiding all over the place, Iran, and there's a territory called Khorasan. Khorasan, it was from India, I think I've written from there, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, India, Iraq, this it was a vast area of uh, Khorasan, and the Gurids, from about 1100 to 1300 are the ones who really kicked off the, the best of the Islamic metalwork in, in the first golden age. Um, metal inlay wasn't new, as I've mentioned on there. It wasn't new to the Islamic world. The Romans had done it, Sasanians had done it. It wasn't, but under the Islamic uh, world, it became, it, it, they took it to another level. It's like the Japanese now, you know, when they, w they borrow somebody else's idea and they take it to another level, you know, they, they, it, it became a, a, an incredible kind of a, a piece of art. Um, so, one of the, the themes I want to explain early on, and I think it goes really well with this MacFest thing, um, the, oh, <laughs> the, there was a, the proximity of Horosan with India, they, there's, there's, there is chronicles as well that, because the, the Hindus were using silver inlay on the gods and goddesses uh, on the eyes. Um, so there is kind of chronicles where Indian workers or Hindu workers were working in the workshops of Herat and in the wor workshops of uh, what, what is now Afghanistan. And so there was probably a, you know, a cross-cultural exchange. And that's what you'll find in Islamic metalwork. You will find all sorts of cultures. You know, Greek uh, culture, there's uh, Christian culture, the Jewish culture, there's uh, a Roman, pre-Islamic, and ancient Egypt as well. So it's, you know, and that's how art is. Art takes on forms from different histories and different epochs. So these uh, metalsmiths, this is like one of, the, one of the superb, I think that's at the Louvre, it's possibly at the Hermitage in, uh, in St. Petersburg. And, the, and St. Petersburg, I think, has got one of the best Islamic art collections in the world in, in Russia. That's from Herat again, 1180 to 1210. Um, then the metalwork then moved, because these craftsmen didn't stay in one place. You've got to remember, they were making this metalwork to sell. So a lot of the metalwork in Herat was exported. And when things dried up or patrons were created elsewhere, a lot of them moved to Mosul. Now, if you know any Arabic history, the Abbasids were, was, it's like the golden age of Islam before the Mongols totally obliterated them and, and demolished them. And the Mosli workers were like classed as the, the best in the world at that time. Europeans were ordering pieces uh, from faraway lands, even in India, uh, even in Sri Lanka, there was, a, there was a ruler who ordered a piece from Mosul. And they were so proud of their work, they used to sign their pieces Mosuli 200 years down the line, even though they had nothing to do with Mosul by that time. So this, it, it, this was the zenith and, you know, of the Mosul and the first golden age. Um, I'll give you an example of one of these pieces. Um, there's a piece which is, uh, the, it's got the Annunciation, the Adoration, the Raising of Lazarus, the Entry into Jerusalem, and the Last Supper. So all Christian themes owned by Sultan Najm al-Din Ayyub, who was a very devout Muslim. So put that in your head. You know when you get these kind of stories of this kind of like, oh, the Muslims and the Christians are always fighting. Well, this kind of challenges that, you know. It's, uh, if you look at this piece here, this is the Sultan Najm's, it's, a, it's an amazing piece uh, with the five Christian scenes. And there is the scene of the Annunciation. So the, if you can look there, that's when, when Mary was told that she's going to give birth to uh, Jesus or Isa. Moving on from there, the Mosul working, this is the Blakasua, which is it, based in um, uh, the British Museum, is one of the world's number one kind of pieces of Islamic metal work. It has poetry on it, it has stories. Uh, it's an amazing piece, which the British took from, a, 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 I think, a French kind of a guy in the 1700s or something. They sued him or something, and they, he lost this piece. 
So this is a close-up detail on the black cat skewer. And like I said, most of the work you can see there, these are musicians, there's a lady there with a guitar, uh, some kind of Jimi Hendrix figure, so, you know. <laughs> um, and this is an amazing thing. I mean, I don't know, I'm sure you ladies all have or want or desire a Hermes bag. Well, this handbag is, is in the Courtauld collection, I think, or was displayed there. And this is made of brass with gold and silver inlay. Probably one of the few in the, well, I think it's the only one in the world that exists. So this is like another level. And look at the creation of this thing. Let me look at the time, 10 minutes. Got to move faster. Okay, it's the second golden age of Islamic metalwork. This is when things get complicated and can connect with this stuff. During the rule of the Mamluks, who were a slave dynasty uh, in Damascus and Egypt, the metalwork moved from uh, Mosul all the way to Cairo and Damascus, namely because the Mongols again. These guys came along, totally demolished Baghdad, the, and they captured some of the workers as well. And so the rest of the workers, whoever could get out, or any artisans, they moved on towards Egypt. They moved on towards uh, Damascus to, to set up their wares there. And this warrior dynasty is, is very famous because they were the first army in the world at the world-famous battle at Ain Jalut to stop the Mongols. They defeated the Mongols at Ain Jalut, and you know, even all military historians tell you it's one of the, the signature kind of battles in world history. I mean, the Christian crusaders actually who ruled the land where Ain Jalut was, they were so scared. They said, okay, we'll move out. You bring your army into the Mamluks because they knew the Mongols were coming because everybody was terrified. And it was the first time the Mongols were actually stopped. So these people, because of their military background, their, their metalwork, if you start looking, they had blazons, they had huntsmen, powerful beasts, lions, eagles, and epic titular calligraphy, you know, which is like, kind of like the egotistical kind of side of the sultan. Uh, this is like a, uh, on an original piece, you can see there's a blazon, it's a, the, the cup, which is of the sake, the, the taster, the wine taster, or the food taster for the sultan, so that it doesn't get poisoned to death. Um, and then we move on. So the Mamluk era saw a move from figurative work, what you saw, uh, what you're going to see in a moment, to monumental calligraphy, like big, large uh, ellipse, uh, big uh, uh, text. Uh, and the, but this period was, again, as I said, it, it kind of surpassed the Mosul work in a sense. The, uh, the next piece I'm going to show you, which is in the Louvre, which some of you might have seen, the Baptiste, it's like, it's the Rolls Royce of Islamic metalwork, which is existing. And it was so important that the French kings, till I think 1700 and something, they were all baptized in the Baptiste de Saint Louis. Um, and again, we're looking at the interna internationalization of this metalwork. Tin was coming from Cornwall in England, zinc from Germany. And that 500 years later in the 19th century, 18th century, the same thing was happening. Sadly, the end of the second golden age happened, inflation, the plague, people couldn't afford to put silver and gold on their pieces. The cost of materials and the invasion by the Ottomans in the 16th century, it more or less diminished the art, and then we're gonna move on to the collection. So up to now, you've seen pieces in museums, and now you're gonna start seeing the pieces from the collection. I thought it's a good idea to do a talk and then punctuate it with the pieces. So this is the, uh, the Baptiste de Saint Louis in, uh, uh, this is like a half a meter size basin, and it's an amazing masterpiece, in, if you look at it in the flesh, which, which has got battle scenes on, and and the king and the, the you know, uh, different princes and all sorts of animals giving chase and zoomorphic figures and fantastical beasts. There's even like there, you can see a, a unicorn. It's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. That's like a close-up of this piece. And it's, it's, it was probably sold to, uh, to somebody who went, took it to France because it's got no Islamic kind of calligraphy on it or anything. It's got six signatures of the Ibn Zayn. He signed it six times and he's, you know, he's put, you know, may Allah forgive him, because he thought he'd made something really superb, but he didn't want to become too big-headed about it, you know, in case, in case he uh, uh, gets God's wrath. So let's we move on now to the Mamluk revival, uh, this period of metalwork. So the 18th and 19th century saw a gradual decline of the Ottoman Empire. You know, there was Napoleon's invasion of Egypt, 1790, was it 92 or 99? Uh, the independence of Greek, the war that was going on, and the, um, the, there was wars all over the place, Crimea on the periphery, the British, the French, and the Russians, they were fighting each other. They were sometimes helping the Ottomans, sometimes they were fighting against the Ottomans. And then uh, this led to a rise in Arab nationalism. And the, the one thing about the Ottomans, I've got to uh, hand it to them, they left the Mamluk system of rule in place because the Mamluks had, uh, had a really efficient system. They put an odd governor in place, but they left the overall system of emirs, the lords of the Mamluks, in place. 
Uh, so the patronage for the metalwork remained, and that's how we get this connection. But it was a smaller scale and more underground. And the, the, these guys, the Mamluks, existed till 1811 under the Ottomans. But in 1811, uh, the governor of uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Muhammad Ali Pasha, who a lot of you know, classed as the modern age of Egypt, he horrifically massacred the, the remaining, uh, this is an Orientalist painting from the 19th century, uh, depicting this horrendous scene where he invited hundreds of the emirs into a tight street of the citadel in Cairo, Saladin Citadel. And in this, he, he, he called them in for a banquet, for food, and said, oh, come and join me and whatever. And when they're all kind of all possibly drunk and full of food or whatever, they're on their way home. There was a tight street with high walls, and he barricaded it, and he massacred them all. He shot them, poured boiling oil over them, and, and arrows and everything. And you can see he's like looking, he doesn't really care, whereas his uh, slaves and stuff are like looking uh, terrified at, at what's going on. And it, 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 this was like a, a big change, you know, the emirs kind of disappeared in 1811. So moving on, love, defiance, and bravado, why, why have I put that title? Well, some of these pieces, which we've separated from the rest of the uh, inlay from that period, they seem to have, like, they seem to capture that mood of that period. There's, there's pieces with classic Arabic poetry from the 11th, 10th century. Uh, Hamdani and Antar. Antar and Abla are actually pre-Islamic and they influenced uh, Shakespeare, the Antar. Uh, there's also harking back to the golden age of Islam and Arab rule, you know, um, with Mamluk, Mamluk titular script, like you look at this tray here, and I can show you some pieces on here, as well as ancient blazons, armorial symbols, uh, uh, images of kings, princes in court scenes. So it's as though the Mamluks, or whoever was ordering these people, the wealthy Arabs, it was like a maybe a rebellion against the kind of Ottomans at that time. This is, as I said, all these pieces you're seeing now are in the collection. So this amazing candlestick, there's a poem on top of it with silver inlay, and you can see the animals running around uh, in this really highly complex shape. Um, th this, this is the kind of uh, titular words you'd, you'd have on a tray. So glory to our master, the Sultan al-Malik al-Mu'ayyad, the learned, the just, Defender of the faith, the warrior of the frontiers, the protector of the frontiers, lion of the world and the religion, Daud, Sultan of Islam and Muslims, the manifestation of justice among all, son of the master, the Sultan al Malik al Muzaffar, the fortunate, the martyr, Shams al Dunya. So you can see they're, they're, not, they're not exactly not bragging. You know, so when you would have gone into a palace or a small, you know, one of their mansions, or, and, you know, you would have walked in and this would have shocked you. It looks like the sun and it says Shams al Din, which mentions the sun. Here's a closer detail of this superb tree. I was going to bring this and uh, Irit rightly so said we've got no space. Uh, so uh, it's, it's about this kind of size. It's a gigantic kind of a monumental size, this thing. Silver and copper inlaid onto uh, brass. Uh, here's another bowl uh, from the 18th and 19th century. This is a sided bowl with a complex shape. Uh, and you can see in the middle that copper cup. Again, this is the armorial cup of the Saki. Uh, it's a blazon of the Mamluks. Moving on to the next slide. So rebellion and invasion of the tourists, right? So as, as the Mamluks, uh, as I said, I've already mentioned the thing about the rebellion and, and the Ottoman yoke. But as the, as the Mamluks were finished off, they were killed off by Muhammad Ali Pasha, the, and there was a rising Arab nationalism, the, and there was a huge book, uh, a brilliant book called uh, Monument du Caire. It's called The Monuments of Cairo by uh, the uh, Egyptologist Priest Evans. People read this in Europe, in America, and the grand tour, tourists started coming to Cairo and Damascus to look at these exotic lands. And, you know, they were really kind of like taken away how, you know, what kind of scenes were, they were in Cairo. So again, here's a candlestick, which is an amazing piece. Um, if you look closely, it's got, similar to the baptistry, uh, figures in, 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 with armor and, and kind of halos and animals and fantastical zoomorphic figures. And again, co very complicated poetry on this piece. Uh, this one is more or less taken of the baptistry. This is like showing a hunting uh, a guy with a sword and a lion attacking him. And if you look around carefully, there's strange creatures floating around in the metalwork. So probably would have taken months to make these kind of pieces. So then we move on to Cairo. I've totally uh, not followed the script at all. <laughs> um, Cairo at this time, if, look, if you look at this quote from the 1001 Nights, 
you know, he who has not seen Cairo has not seen the world. It's dust is gold, it's Nile is a wonder, it's houses are palaces, it's air is temperate, uh, agar wood, cheering the heart, and how would, could Cairo, the mother of the world. So Cairo was an amazing place anyway, even, even for the Arabs who lived there. It wasn't just the uh, Europeans. Uh, let me see if I can get into this thing. Uh, oh, um, one second. I've been timed out in that uh, frenzy of uh, talking. One second. Just catch up on this thing. Okay, I think we're there now. Yeah, that's fine now. So as I said, these wealthy tourists came uh, from America, United States, Germany, Britain mainly, France, and they were traveling around the streets of Cairo looking for the wares that they'd seen in the mosques. And in the, there wasn't really, I think the first museum was about 1890. So they, they would have seen Islamic, uh, you know, genuine pieces in the, in the great mosques of the Mamluk mosques of Cairo and in the great palaces. Um, and a demand got created for this Mamluk revival. Uh, so it wasn't just the old emirs who'd, who'd wanted these kind of pieces made. The Europeans created a demand as well. And exponentially, there was a rise in the manufacture of this silver inlay in, in Damascus, and uh, the technique like, came back to life. You know, considering after the Ottoman invasion, it kind of died off. It, it suddenly came back. And they were saying that Damascus actually was the more prolific manufacturer. There was, even though in Damascus, there wasn't as many kind of Mamluk um, buildings and things for them to copy, there were, there were probably 300 workmen compared to about 30 workshops in uh, Cairo at this time. And um, we'll just go through uh, Cairo at this time. So this is like an Orientalist painting. You can see a candlestick there on the right-hand side, a 19th century. The painter of this possibly was just, he stayed and lived in Paris or London. He did never even went to Egypt. Uh, maybe some kind of a drawing came back or something. But there was an imagination going on amongst the Europeans of Orientalism and all these harems and, and, and the fantasy kind of image that started, you know, with, with, with the kind of tourists who went to Cairo. Um, and here's another Orientalist painting. You can see some of the wares that these ladies are buying uh, and looking and being sold in the streets of Cairo. And, you know, it was an amazing, must have been an amazing time, you know, because even now if you visit Cairo, and I thoroughly recommend it, it's, it's one of them cities which is, is, is still kind of, you feel as though you step back to the 12th and 13th century. Um, we'll move on. And, you know, here's an old photograph probably from about 1810 or something. And one of the amazing things of Cairo, you know, you could in the morning go to the Khan al Khalili Bazaar and buy like that bowl or that tray. And in the afternoon, go to Heliopolis and buy a mummy or two, like the museum probably has. <laughs> Here's a mummy seller in Cairo <laughs> in the 19th century. So it must have been an amazing kind of place to be. So 19th century Damascus, again, you know, the, the Europeans came, as I said, there were 300 workshops. Damascus was noted that Jewish girls and women, I mean, this was noted by one of the travelers at the time, an Englishman, I forgot his name. He said that Jewish girls and women were employed in Damascus because of maybe their nimble hands or whatever, I'm not sure. He, he mentioned that. And whereas in Cairo, it was mainly men. Maybe they've got nimble hands. I've no idea. Uh, the, the peak of the silver inlay technique between 1880 to the start of World War I, and the Mamluk revival, it was very popular. And even European companies such as Kinko, you, if, if you go and look in the odd second-hand shop or eBay or an auction, Kinko was a, a European manufacturer and they made pieces copying the Mamluk revival, but they were machine pressed and they were manufactured by machines. And then new styles came about around 1900 to 1914, biblical, people were visiting the Holy Land, so you had like stories of Moses or Joseph and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it, it, you know, the, the art changed, it left this kind of uh, the scene behind, an art deco and, you know, after the war. So here's, here's a really rare picture, that's probably about 1910 in uh, Damascus, and you can see how many pieces this guy is selling. Um, he's very proud of his shop. And this is some guys still, you know, and, and a lot of the manufacturing techniques carried on through families for generations. So some of these manufacturers may have been making pieces in the 14th, 15th century, you know, the, the original forefathers. And uh, this uh, piece I want to, this picture is an interesting picture. I, I don't know whether you can see at the back, but this is dated, I think, 1860. 
It's one of the earliest photographs in the world, actually, but it says uh, Mr. Zeman. It's like old Cairo, and it's an antique seller, and there's a, there's a charger on there. I've got no kind of um, uh, laser pointer, but I've got a closer picture. Um, so this charger, we've zoomed in on there. It's not a very clear picture. About four years ago, I was very lucky at an auction to find the exact thing in Grange over Sands. So you can, you know, it, this piece, we've actually counted the baubles, and they are on that charger. So that is like such a massive and eerie coincidence. And then, as I said, you know, the pieces were changing in the nature. So here's the, uh, uh, that's the ten, uh, ten Commandments, that's Moses with the two strange, those two strange things on Moses' head are the horns of knowledge. Uh, when Moses gained his knowledge, the, the, you know, uh, he, he got horns of knowledge, uh, God says. And then this is the Ark of the Covenant uh, and the, the lions of Judea and with the birds and things, you know, going on. So that's like, uh, again, made in Damascus, probably. Um, and this is a very interesting piece. So if you look at this one, it's, it's got Adam and Eve in the middle with, in the Garden of uh, Eden. And on the sides, it's got like stories from the Old Testament. Um, you've got Samson, you've got Noah's Ark at the bottom there, you've got Abraham, uh, I think Abraham, and there's David, uh, there's Moses at the top, where there were lots of people saying, let my people go to Pharaoh. Um, it's an amazing piece, and I think that's uh, Solomon the Great, uh, no, yeah, no, Solomon the Prophet, the, and this piece is, if you look on the inner circle, I, I think, I've got, yeah, that's a close-up, so on the inner circle, you can see Hebrew. On the outer circle, you can see Arabic. So the manufacturer of this, I mean, I, I don't know who it was aimed at, but it's obviously aimed at tourists, or maybe it was a patron within the Middle East. But what you have to remember, in the 19th century, uh, probably only 4 or 5% of the population could read or write. So a lot of these pieces, they would have had to bring somebody in to write that if it can be read. Sometimes it can't be read. They just put letters together. You know, just to sell it on to the unwary kind of uh, traveler from the West. Just wanted to mention this little subject because of the kind of buildings we have in Manchester and things. The Gothic Revival and the arts and crafts and the demise of the Mamluk Revival. It's, it's a strange kind of linkage between these uh, movements. Uh, the arts and crafts movement in the United Kingdom developed simultaneously the Mamluk Revival. And this was a case of where it was seen that something from the past was better than now in the 19th century. So Pugin, who was a big follower of Owen Jones, who'd, who'd done a study, um, Owen Jones had done a study of Orientalist art and the Alhambra. Pugin, who designed the uh, Houses of Parliament, if, if some of you probably already know, he used some of the, the Islamic design concepts in the Houses of Parliament, with inside the building and on the outside, and on the windows and on the tile floor. So it's, it's an amazing thing that so much Islamic architecture just secretly hidden around in. And again, the Gothic revival, as I mentioned here, it was an attempt to capture mythical, long last, you know, medieval utopia. You know, uh, and again, as I said, this is a, an international affair. Tin was from Cornwall, brass from Germany and Britain. Recycled brass this time from Germany and Britain was coming through to Egypt and uh, Syria, uh, as well as the Middle East. But however, after World War I, European taste changed and the artisans, poor fellows, they started struggling, you know, to, to try and keep up with the taste. Uh, Tutankhamun's tomb got found in 1920-something. Uh, Art Deco came out. Um, so they were making umbrella stands, and they were making cigarette dispensers and, and modern kind of lamps with silver inlay and, and, and electrification as well. Electrification was more prevalent. So candlesticks, which was one of the great Islamic traditions, was more, they weren't really needed anymore. So if you think about it, these would have been the chandeliers of the ancient times. In, in the 1920s, electric and gas light was coming around, all over the world. They were, they were not really required. So this was a kind of sad, more or less, demise and the ending of the uh, Mamluk revival. So quickly going on to the collection. Uh, as I said, it's 1,500 pieces, maybe more. Two or 300 of those are probably important. Uh, we, we've kind of split them up into three categories. Um, we've called them Cairo wear or regular tourist items like the cigarette uh, boxes or, uh, you know, or those kind of things. The Mamluk revival pieces, which actually um, mention a sultan or something, but they always have the same script, al Nasser, the victorious, al, uh, al Adil, or you know, just or whatever. So they, 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 kind of, they were just copying maybe stencils to make the Mamluk uh, revival. And these key pieces, if you look when, you, uh, when I've finished the talk here, 
These, as I said, are the more serious pieces, which actually mention specific sultans and the kunya, which is the title of the sultan, is, is actually in the correct order. Uh, and also they have complex Arabic uh, poetry and things. So these are a different kettle of fish and there's not hundreds and hundreds of these, you know. Um, so as I said, the collection has small trinket boxes to Quran boxes, which are like 60, 70 centimeters in, 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 in length. Uh, trays and chargers from little trays, like six centimeters, like cup holders all the way to 1.2, 1.3 meters. Um, incense burners, uh, ewers and water sprinklers, tables and stands, bowls and basins. And, and in our collection, one of the most important things are, the, are these candlesticks, these armorial candlesticks. So again, I'll, uh, this, this quote I've put onto this ewer, this ewer is in my collection. But this quote from the Her uh, Herat manuf uh, manufacturers, and it just made me laugh. My beautiful, you are pleasant and elegant in the world of today, who can find the like? Everyone who sees it says, it's very beautiful. No one has found it twin because there are no others like it. And it's a lot longer, this poem. This ewer is for water and they make it in Herat. In what other century can they make the like of it? And if you saw the original, I, I'd, I would agree. Seven heavenly bodies, however proud they may be, are protection for the one who works so. Let kindness come down on the one who makes such a ewer. So he's, he's uh, self-congratulating himself. Who wastes gold and silver and so decorates it? Because he wants the patron to order some more pieces. Let happiness come to him if he gives the ewer to a friend. Let trouble come if he surrenders it to an enemy. So I just thought it was an interesting thing written on a piece. You know, it was always like marketing kind of material on your item that you're selling. So I'm just going to go through a bit more of the theory side of the metalwork. I've got a few minutes, I think. Um, metalwork as an art and technique employed by craftsmen. So I kind of got this thing of Wikipedia and, and put it towards kind of the collection that we have. So you've got five functions of art. Uh, one of the first ones is beauty. And I think this is the main thing that probably draws in all humans, you know, mankind across the world. Uh, the basic instinct for harmony, balance, and rhythm. So there's an overwhelming feature of art, especially Islamic art, is, is beauty. However, if some, uh, th this is something to remember. If an artist made something too perfect in Islamic art, especially like the Persian rug makers, or if they were too proud of something, they actually used to make a purposeful mistake in their art. So that was to show that they are not God. They are not equal to the, the creator who is the maker of perfection. So these art artists were extremely humble as well. Uh, number two, experience the mysterious. You know, when we look at art, something mysterious about art, you know, like if you look at a, an interesting abstract painting, the mis mystery draws you in. So the usage of the, the Muslim artists, or, you know, uh, artists of Islamic art, used calligraphy and zoomorphic animals and incredible beasts and fantastical beasts to draw the, to the observer in. Uh, expression of imagination by a non-grammatical way, which I think, for me, is a big connection to MacFest especially. That means a universal language, a metaphor, in the sense that art is doing the talking. So when anybody can observe this piece, they don't need to be a Muslim or a, a devout person, or they, they can be any. But a, a human being, when they observe a, a piece of art, whatever it is, it could be provocative, it could be subtle, they, they, it's a non-grammatical language. There's no talking. The piece is doing the talking. And I think that's what unifies us humans. And this, this is the important message that I am hoping that this collection throughout the world, as we travel around with it eventually, we want to get the message across that Muslims have got to understand that they were, they were heavily involved in art. You know, they've always have had a, a, a big investment. And suddenly we're told, oh, no, we're not. We can destroy all the history, historical arts. It's a lot of rubbish. Um, so number four, ritualistic and symbolic functions of art. So sometimes you'll have a piece made specifically, hold, hold something. And I'll explain all these with the pictures in a moment. And motivated purpose. Motivated purpose, art as entertainment. You know, you've got your poetry, political change, propaganda, or for subversion. You know, and, and I love subversive stuff. Here we go. So here, this tray is an amazing tray, uh, owned by a British dignitary in 1910. It's got a signature on the side somewhere. I haven't taken a picture. But I put the hadith of the Prophet there, where, Allah, uh, where, where the Prophet said, Verily, Allah is beautiful, and Allah loves beauty. I.e., God is beautiful, and God loves beauty. And we should always remember that, you know. Uh, this is another close-up of this superb uh, uh, tray, probably made in Cairo. You can see fish, uh, kind of uh, Kufic calligraphy. There's little birds. Uh, it's, it's, and there's work behind the silver as well. It's, uh, 
you could go on forever on this but you can see little peacocks over there it's, it's an amazing piece um, this piece this candlestick is a very interesting candlestick as i say where they were saying art you know where, where it draws the observer in so here you've got on the top anthropomorphic calligraphy which has got people on it and then this middle band is zoomorphic and anthropomorphic i mean there's some kind of modern woman there with long hair so this is a kind of a, a strange piece and, and very interesting. And this type of calligraphy did exist in the ancient times for only a short period, about 70 years, I think 1300 or something, the, it, the calligraphy suddenly started doing it. And then it fell out of uh, favor, but it was probably difficult to do. But in the 19th century, it was brought back in, on the odd piece. Not many pieces have that. Uh, this piece, again, the metaphor, the non-grammatical talk. So this piece is uh, fish which I think everybody can understand is connected to water and purity, and that's the bo bottom of a bowl. So this, you wouldn't even see this. This basin would have been put down, and you're washing your hands over it, and there's work on the inside of this basin and on the sides, and, and they've gone all the way and decorated the underneath. But as, as I said, that metaphor, I think most of us understand that fish and water kind of go together. Um, this tray is an amazing piece, about the same size as this one, and we have to get really close and personal with this. So if you look there, I don't know whether the people at the back can see that. So again, it's like looking down into a pond. So you've got all these sea creatures and snakes and zoomorphic calligraphy, uh, fish. Uh, it's, it's madness. Everything's going on. Is it a coral reef? Is it in heaven? I, I have no idea. I've gone even closer there. So you can see these kind of animal-headed kind of calligraphy and those strange faces and, and the fish and the bigger fishes. Probably what was seen in the Red Sea. And, but I think this is a definite piece from Cairo. Uh, then we're talking about function. Uh, here's a, a Quran casket about 55, 60, 60 centimeters uh, square. Huge thing, probably 25, 30 kilograms. This was probably copied of the original one. The original one exists in the Cairo Museum, uh, owned by the Sultan Kalawun, uh, which was given to one of the mosques in the, at the time of Kalawun. Uh, it would have held a 30 volume Quran. Um, and again, silver and copper inlays on top of brass. And here's the top of this. You can read it there. I'm sure most of you can read it. Quran al Kareem, Ayatul Kursi, probably on there in Kufic and different scripts and just an amazing uh, uh, array of colors. Uh, this is my favorite piece out of my whole collection, out of everything. I love this candlestick. These figures in the center, like dome on the dome, they, they're like almost like a Fatimid revival, which I don't know whether, I don't want to go into that. It's, uh, it's another uh, uh, talk that really, but they, they're magical figures. You've got like a Pegasus, you've got this, uh, the eagle kind of attacking the hair. Uh, it's, it's a superb piece and with, with very complex uh, poetry on it. And, and probably, I, you know, I, I, I just would, if, I mean, Muslims are not allowed to be buried with something, but that, that piece I'd like to be if I could have been. <laughs> so. Um, this is an interesting piece. Uh, I think a lot of uh, people love this piece. Always come. This is a pair of candlesticks as well, actually, and it's reminiscent of the baptistry. So you can see these, and, and if you look at the eyes, the Turkic kind of features, you've got to remember the Mamluks were Turkic, most of them were Turkic, uh, but some of them were like European. You know, there was, it was in the original Mamluk times, a blonde haired, blue eyed Amir could have easily been going on his horse in 1250 in the streets of Cairo, you know, it was, it was not an unusual thing. But you can see all sorts, this guy's fighting a, a, some kind of a dragon or a snake, there's a, a pet dog there, hunting dog, um, and kind of these different kind of eyes and birds and things, and I don't know, it's all over the, and this guy's shooting the birds and he's catching them, I don't know, what, I don't know what's going on. Um, and this is usually a, a very typical Islamic scene where they've got the gazelle on the back, the gazelle, if you know much about Islamic art, it, it kind of comes up um, regularly because it, it, it's either re represents the sultan's power over the, his subjects or man's power over women. So I, I don't know whether I'm allowed to say that nowadays. <laughs> but the gazelle with the doe eyes and the houris of the heaven or whatever, the, it represented that. So it was kind of the woman submitting herself to man. That, that's, that's the kind of connotations of the gazelle. Cross-cultural influences, as we talked before, the Star of David, the Lotus of ancient Egypt, um, and many designs were taken from architecture, the Greeks and Christianity, the fish, you know, the Alpha Omega of the Greeks and the Coptic and Byzantine. Um, here's a, a Judaica tray with the Star of David, with a, a gold on top of silver at the back. 
um, and with crescents around it, so it's uh, probably still under, it's still under the Ottoman control. But you know, the Ottomans actually got on with their Jewish subje subjects; they didn't really have a major problem. Um, the next next piece is the here. Uh, you can't really see this, but these are the lotus of the ancient Egypt on this piece, and this uh, just brass on this uh, amazing piece. Epigraphy and imagery, superlative use of imagery and complex calligraphy and geometry. And they used calligraphy and complex geometry to draw the observer in. And sometimes you read it and it was just a simple message. It wasn't even that complicated, but it was, it was a trick that the artist used. So this superb tray uh, with the calligraphy in the middle, it's got Quran on it. And then they put calligraphy on top of the calligraphy, which is not easy. To, especially to write the verses of the Quran. It's an extremely, extremely rare piece. I've never, I think I've seen another one like it, but not as big. Uh, this huge bowl, about 60 centimeters dam, is, is from a pair of basins. So you've got magical animals, two bands of calligraphy, and there's calligraphy on the top. Uh, we'll move on quickly. So you've got work on the inside with these giant fish, and again, the, the script of the Mamluks, uh, the Al Malik al Sultan. Uh, and this is the underneath of the basin. And I said, this is all, you can see that's my arm there. Um, it's a bit tanned, but it's, yeah. So this thing's about 60 centimeters, I think, from what I remember. Geometry and cosmology. Geometry in Islamic art is highly important. It signified the, the oneness of God because in geometry, all geometry starts off at one point and come back to that same point, which means it comes back to God. And these complex designs are like infinite space. And then there was symbols as well of cosmology. You know, there's like a guy who's got his legs folded. I think he's one of the planets or something. And there's all sorts of kind of uh, uh, things connected uh, with the... So here's a, a complex calligraphy, uh, uh, sorry, complex geometry in the middle of this tray with the calligraphy pointing towards the geometry. Um, and, then, and this is that fella I told you about. Uh, he, he represents, I think, a planet, or I'm sure this Irit probably could tell me who he represents, um, but he represents one of the heavenly bodies in Islamic art from the ancient times. This is an interesting box. It's called a kalamdan, which is a pen box. It's about half a meter in, in length. Uh, you know, th this, I brought this in to, on the pictures to show you. This is the interior of the pen box. Um, and then when we move on, you can see the lid. Well, Again, that Sagittarius, I'm sure some of you are into your astrology, shooting his bow and that's a Sagittarius, shooting this kind of a, a mythical beast. The Quran, Quran, Quranic pieces are the rarest in the, in the collection. The, I'd say Quranic pieces are the rarest. Out of the whole collection between the United States and here, out of hundreds and hundreds of pieces, we have about 20. So why that is, in the old times, when the Quranic pieces were made, the maker, used to be in a state of voodoo, which was ablution. So imagine trying to stay in ablution and making one of them pieces for weeks on end. So you're not gonna get much work done. So that was one of the reasons. The other second reason was, it was felt that if you made a big tray, somebody could disrespect it. They could put something filthy on it or unclean hands. It, it, you know, nowadays you could probably go to Mecca or Medina and you can pick up these trays or whatever and made in China, made of plastic with God's name written on them. There's millions of them. But in those days, the makers were kind of conscious because there is, there is uh, hadiths where kind of, you know, or, or I think in the Quran where Allah says, don't sell my words cheap. So you have to be careful. And that's why the Quranic pieces are the rarest pieces. Uh, th this is an amazing uh, over half a meter tall vase uh, designed as a mosque lamp. It can't work as a mosque lamp. It's just purely decorative because it's got no holes. And it's got the Ayat al-Kursi, the throne verse, and the name of Prophet Muhammad. Um, and this is a similar near pair with more silver on it. And again, the, I think it's Ayat al-Kursi on this piece as well. Poetry, as I said, the, po the Arabs absolutely loved poetry. They had poetry before Islam. Uh, the seven hanging poems of the Kaaba. The Kaaba had poems stuck onto it. Um, and you know, it, was, it, it showed sophistication, it showed culture. So, so whoever was into poetry, you know, it, even now most Arab people, they struggled reading some of the classical poetry and this Hamdani, uh, Antar and Abla, uh, they're the kind of poems. Um, so this is a quote from, I think, um, oh, the fairest person to all except in my treatment. You carry grudges and you are the opponent and the arbiter. So this is a poem by Muatta Nabi uh, to uh, so Saiful Doilia, I think his name was. He was a poet and a prince and he wanted a curry back favor. He wanted to go back in favor of the, of the emir, of the prince. 
Uh, let me see. Uh, and here, this is, now I'm going to quickly move on to the, uh, I don't want to take too long. This is the technique of the manufacture. I thought I may as well cover it. So silver inlay is very difficult. Basically, you have to beat the brass. Um, these are inlays in Damascus. So it, 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 multiple artisans are involved in it. So firstly, you'll beat the brass or the copper into the shape, which will take, I don't know how long. Secondly, and this is the most expensive stage, the calligrapher. He will draw the stencil for the designs on top of the piece. Then another artisan would engrave surface following the stencils. And then the inlayer would hammer softer metals uh, on top of the piece. And finally, more engravings on top of the softer metal. And, you know, and these kind of trade secrets ran in families. This film, uh, I think I'm hoping, this is very rare footage that we actually found on, on the internet. So if you look at those guys there hammering away, I mean, it's a bit speeded up. It's, they are actually inlays in about 1920s. That film's gone all over the world. I was the first to find it. <laughs> okay, so that's... So, conclusion. Collection, as I said, is relevant. It shows continuity from the 12th century till the 20th century of Islamic art. There was no major breaks. You know, academicians have always said, oh, Islamic art disappeared in the 1700s or 1600s. It, it didn't. It shows the diverse nature of Islamic art and the, the makers, the manufacturers, the patrons. Uh, and even at a time of stress in the Dar es Salaam, the lands of Islam now, with the current events as we know, I always think that this, as I said before, acts as a unifier, as a bridge between humanity, you know, between us all. Uh, as manufacturers go now, there's some manufacturers in Cairo, Damascus and Jerusalem. This in the shade of the 19th century, they're not as good. Interestingly enough, in, Af in Afghanistan, the, the inlay technique has started again about 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. These guys were making fake Seljuk pieces. They're pretty good. The only problem is they only always write the same text, but the technique is still there. So there's hope. I mean, if that was Britain, no doubt a school would start up to, to kind of employ these people and train them, but I don't know. I, I hope it can survive and come back as a, as a, as a skill that the, the Islamic world gave you know, to the rest of the world. Okay, I think that's, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.